In this lecture, we're going to discuss Software Component Analysis, or SCA. Imagine walking into a gourmet kitchen. There's an endless variety of ingredients. Some are fresh, some are high-quality canned goods, and others, well, they're not. They're not fresh. You can think of our software development kind of like a gourmet dish. And all the ingredients are bits of code that we use, including open source components. Just like with cooking, the quality of your ingredients can make or break your final product. So I think let's start out by looking at what we mean by software composition. The software we build today is really made entirely from scratch. Most often we assemble it from a variety of components. That can be proprietary code, commercial off-the-shelf software, COTS, and it can be open source libraries and frameworks. By doing that, we can rapidly build and deploy new features and capabilities because we leverage that pre-existing tested code. But by doing that, we also introduce new risks because each component in the software stack has its own dependencies, its own licenses, and potential vulnerabilities. Meaning if those components are not properly managed and monitored, they can introduce security, legal, and operational risks to our organization, which is where SCA comes in. Because the SCA process automatically identifies the open source and third-party components in our software application, and then checks those components for known security vulnerabilities, license compliance issues, and outdated versions. And the SCA tools works by scanning the application source code, the bytecode, or the binary files, and then it compares that against a database of known components and their associated metadata. And the metadata can be the version number, the license type, the known security vulnerabilities based on the national vulnerability database, the common vulnerability and exposure list, and it also looks at the dependencies and the relationships with other components. And by using those tools, the developers and the security teams gets a detailed report for the application, and it flags any components that may pose a risk. And by doing that, we get early risk detection because we identify the potential issues in the development process, which then allows the team to remediate the risk before we put it into production. We can also have continuous monitoring. We can integrate SCA into the CI/CD pipeline, and when we do that, we get that continual monitoring for new vulnerabilities or changes in the component landscape. It also makes sure that we're license compliant. Because if we use other people's software, we of course need to have a license for it. And by having that mapped out, we both reduce the legal risk. We also reduce the risk of intellectual property disputes. And it can also give us proper dependency management. Because we have that visibility into the complex web of dependencies in the software stack, we know what's relying on what. That can help us with the updates and the patch levels much more efficiently. So when we implement SCA to do it efficiently and effectively, we have to have the combination of the right tools, the right processes, and the right cultural practices. That can mean we have an inventory for all open software and third-party components used in the application, including the version and the license. We start early, meaning we integrate SCA into the earlier stages of the development process. That means the requirement and design phase. That way, we can make sure that potential issues are identified and addressed before we have spent a significant amount of development on that project. And of course, we need to educate the developers. We give them the right training, we raise their awareness, they have the proper guidelines they need so they understand the importance of SCA and how to use the tool effectively. And then of course, we need clear policies. We have policies and procedures around how to use open source and third-party components meaning we have requirements for securities testing, we have license reviews, we have approval processes. Having those clear policies and procedures means the developers clearly understand what is acceptable and what is not. As part of SCA, we also prioritize and triage because not all vulnerabilities pose the same level of risk. By having that clear process for prioritizing and triaging the SCA findings, we're going to focus our attention where it's needed. And that should be based on factors like the severity of the vulnerability, the criticality of the affected component, and how difficult it is to remediate. And here, we also want to automate and integrate as much as possible to the extent that it makes sense. If we integrate SEA into the development workflow, we automate it as much as possible, then it's more likely it's going to be a successful tool. And we can do that by integrating with the build systems. We can automatically open tickets for identified issues, and we can block builds that don't meet certain quality gates. And here again, throughout the entire process, we monitor and update. It's not just we've done it, we're done. We need that continual monitoring throughout the entire process because new code is consistently going to be added, new vulnerabilities might occur, or there might be updates in the component landscape. So we have that monitoring and updating to help us have the proper process for us to update and patch the components in a timely manner. And then finally, we need to have a culture of collaboration. By having that collaboration between development, security, and operations, DevSecOps, 
the SCA findings should be treated like a shared responsibility with all the teams working together to understand and mitigate the risks. And while SCA is a wonderful tool, it can do a bunch of things, it's not a silver bullet. It's not going to fix every single issue. It can help us identify known vulnerabilities in open source and third-party components, but it can't find issues in our proprietary code, and it cannot detect novel attack vectors. So implementing the SCA should be a part of our larger application security program, where we also have practices like secure coding training, static and dynamic analysis, penetration testing, threat modeling. It's just another tool that we have in our tool bag that makes us more secure. With SCA, one of the challenges we're going to have is managing false positives and false negatives. False positives happen when the SCA tool flags a component as vulnerable when it's not, and this most often due to incomplete or outdated information in the vulnerability database. False negatives happen when the tool misses a vulnerability, either because it's not in the database or because the analysis was not comprehensive enough. So to manage that, it's really important for us to tune the SA tool's settings and thresholds based on our organization's risk tolerance and the specific criteria of that application, just like we do with our firewalls and our monitoring systems, our IDS, our IPS there will most likely be tweaks and fixes forever. For the SCA, that might be adjusting the severity levels for different types of vulnerabilities or setting policies for how to handle components with no known vulnerabilities, but also no active maintenance. And then we need to have the proper processes in place for manually reviewing and validating the SCA findings. Automated tools are amazing, but in most cases, we need someone to actually verify this is an issue. And even more so if it's a high risk of business critical application. So we need that manual review, we need the code reviews, we need vulnerability scannings, penetration testing to confirm the presence or absence of a vulnerability. And finally, we need to realize that SCA is a rapid evolving field. There's new tools, new databases, new practices emerging all the time. We have to stay up to date with the latest development. We have to continually improve our organization SCA-based processes. And we do that based on our feedback and our lessons learned. All right, let's recap. In this lecture, we talked about Software Component Analysis, SCA, and that's the process of identifying and analyzing open source and third-party components that we use in our software applications. We started out with an analogy where we compared software development to cooking, where the quality of the ingredients, the code components, is going to greatly impact the product. The way we develop software systems today is often based on various components. That can be our own proprietary code, it can be commercial off-the-shelf software, and it can be open source libraries. And by doing that, we get that rapid development process. Software doesn't take many years to develop, but it also introduces risk related to security vulnerabilities, license compliance, and outdated versions. Some of the key benefits of SEA is early risk detection, continuous monitoring, license compliance, and dependency management. And for an effective SEA implementation, we should follow some best practices. We need to start it early in the development process. We need to educate our developers. We have to have clear policies and procedures. We prioritize and triage our findings, meaning the most important first. And then we automate and integrate SCA into the entire development workflow. We have continual monitoring and updating of components. And then we need to make sure that we have that culture of collaboration, DevSecOps, development, security operations. If they all work together, if they all see the problems as being a team effort, we're going to have a much better product. And then, of course, remember that SCA is not the solution to everything. It's part of our comprehensive application security program. SCA only focuses on commercial off-the-shelf software and open-source software. Anything that we have developed, it cannot check for. And with SCA, we need to tweak the system over time to make sure that we don't get a lot of false positives or false negatives. And whenever we do get them, we need to go in and manually verify those findings. If it is a false positive or a false negative, we need to tweak the settings a little. And then as SCA continues to evolve, our organization has to stay informed about the latest development, and we have to continually improve our processes based on our feedback and our lessons learned. And with that, we are done with this lecture. I hope this has helped you get a little more insight into what SCA does, why we want to use it, and what it does not do. Thank you for being here, and I will see you in the next lecture.